Oh, thanks. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. I hope you write them up. Yeah, I'm going to. I'm going to. Great. Great. Yeah. I, I didn't say that. I didn't give you, butter you up just to try to stick the knife <laughs> in. <laughs> Okay, let's go ahead and start. So, uh, I'm super impressed how many people are here at 9 o'clock in the morning. Uh, for some of you, I guess you're on this time zone, but still, I'm sure many of you were out late. So, so um, let's continue our discussion today with uh, where we uh, ended yesterday. So, we're discussing thermal dark matter in the sense of uh, things that were in thermal equilibrium, thermal dark matter. And so where we concluded yesterday was this idea that if you have a state which has some process that maintains equilibrium in the early universe, um, that you end up predicting that the density of dark matter today is approximately equal to 0.1 times a cross-section uh, like this, OK? So this is where people end up. And then they note, as we did yesterday, that this number, 3 times 10 to the minus 26, is approximately equal to alpha squared over the weak scale, where alpha if you put in something which is like the fine structure constant in the weak scale, you put in something like 200 GeV. And of course, as we were saying, there are a lot of order one factors that give you a lot of freedom in this. But this is the Wimp miracle that tells us that we should be thinking, at least we have some motivation to think about models that are um, uh, at the weak scale. So things that have annihilation cross sections which are characterized by uh, the weak scale. So the first thing to note is since we're trying to be a little precise, I'll note that even though people toss around this number of 3 times 10 to the minus 26, obviously that's uh, an approximate number. Um, it's not accurate for all models. Um, as a function of mass, um, you actually will find that, in general, heavier ones are more like 2 times 10 to the minus 26, and lighter ones are more like 5 times 10 to the minus 26, so if you go below 10 GeV. And you can find a, an accurate calculation in this paper by Steigman, Dasgupta, and Beekham, where they numerically solve Boltzmann equation and end up with the actual value of sigma v that gives you the correct relic abundance. Uh, people like to often use 3 times 10 to the minus 26 because if you're looking for uh, uh, dark matter signals, it's better to have a larger cross section, and so people will you know, give themselves that little extra kick. Um, but uh, just be aware. So the next step is uh, of this lecture is canonical. Uh, so once you say that you're going to find you you have this kind of a scenario giving you uh, thermal equilibrium, then the next thing I'm supposed to do is I'm supposed to draw this diagram, which is that diagram again. And I say to you the following. I say, look, now we have, now that we know that this diagram exists in the early universe, 
we can look at this diagram in multiple directions, and each one of those gives us an opportunity to talk about finding dark matter. So what do I mean? I mean that if I can draw this annihilation diagram going this way, then I can draw this annihilation diagram going that way. right? So I'll have signals where I have standard model particles producing dark matter, and I say that's something that you do at a collider. Right? So you go to a collider, and you make dark matter, and so that's one avenue for detection. Then I say, look, now we can think about this diagram going this direction. And if you go this direction with this diagram, then that's dark matter coming in and scattering off of a standard model particle and then recoiling. So this is something where you might have a nucleus that gets kicked by dark matter. And so this would be a diagram for direct detection. And then lastly, I say to you that you can think about the original direction of this diagram where dark matter goes this way. Two dark matter particles come in and standard model particles come out. And that is a situation where around us in the halo of the Milky Way or in the center of the Milky Way or in dwarf galaxies or throughout the history of the universe, dark matter could have been annihilating and thus produce standard model signals that you can see in the Fermi Space Telescope, in AMS or Pamela, in its effects on the CMB, and so on. And so this direction that I talk about indirect detection. And that's all pretty good. This is partially true and partially PR. Uh, if this were a colloquium, then you focus on the PR, but this is a summer school, so we'll try to focus on the truth. <laughs> this direction, where you're talking about standard model particles producing colliders, is at the outset, you know, a very, very challenging one because what you really want to look for at colliders is usually missing energy signals. And while it is true that you might have something where you say have QQ bar producing dark matter or glue glue producing dark matter, that is a terrible, terrible signal to look for because it's standard model going to nothing. And you need to have some signal that you can look for that gives you a visible signal that you can see the dark matter recoiling off of. So there are a lot of searches for things like mono jet, mono Z, um, that can give you some limits on uh, dark matter. But those tend to usually be less constraining than um, the more model dependent searches where it's put into context and you produce a heavier particle usually, maybe a colored particle, maybe a charged particle, then decays down. And that gives you some good charge signal that you can look for or a colored signal that you can look for. So it is true that you can have standard model, standard model producing dark matter. Usually the most sensitive searches for dark matter involve the context of the dark matter particle. As far as direct detection goes, well, if you want this scattering to happen, then this standard model particle here has to be something that lives inside of a nucleus. And that could be a, uh, a quark. It could be a gluon field strength. Um, but if you're, for instance, annihilating into Higgs bosons or W bosons, then that's not going to give you a large tree-level coupling to uh, nucleons. So just because you have standard model particles over here doesn't mean that you have appreciable uh, direct detection scattering cross-section. And they're very, very reasonable uh, WIMP, sir, uh, WIMP models where the direct detection cross-section is down at the level of 10 to the minus 49 centimeters squared, which is extremely low, and back where you're confronting the uh, um, background neutrinos for these uh, experiments. And then, of course, the last one is where you have dark matter coming in and standard model coming out, and that's indirect detection. And that is, a, that is the most robust of these claims, probably, because what you actually are saying about a thermal WIMP is that it must have some means by which it annihilates into the standard model particles, but there are many, many different final states that could be over here. And so you have to worry about a lot of different signals. Those can be neutrinos, those can be gamma rays coming from hadronic cascades, they can be antimatter. Uh, so there are a lot of different scenarios that you need to consider. Um, moreover, the cross-section in general, but not totally generally, can be expanded as a partial wave expansion in powers of V. And in the early universe, even if you're non-relativistic, V squared can be something like a tenth. And so there can often be reasons, often if you have a Majorana particle for dark matter, that can suppress this leading order. So this is the S wave, uh, P wave, D wave, and so on. Uh, you can have. Uh, uh, symmetries that suppress the S-wave annihilation cross-section so it can be artificially small. So in the early universe, the thing that might be approximately 3 times 10 to the minus 26 
could be this P wave annihilation cross section. But today, V is more like 10 to the minus 3. And so V squared is like 10 to the minus 6. So your annihilation signals inside of, say, the Milky Way are down by a factor of 10 to the 5 compared to what they would have been in the early universe. So while it is true that you do expect there to be some annihilation signal, it is very, very, very reasonable to have models where the, the signal rate that you get today is much smaller than you would have expected uh, from uh, just sort of like naively thinking about the early universe. And be very careful about this because you'll see plots, uh, especially from uh, uh, these gamma ray searches where people will put a line on the plot that says canonical WIMP. And they'll say, look, we're excluding the canonical WIMP below 50 GeV or 80 GeV or 30 GeV. And that's always under the assumption that you can make this be that. And if this is not that, which is totally not even an exotic model, then uh, those limits don't apply. Questions about this? Is there a problem about the reason why you can't have a P? Like, 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 between S3 and P waves? Like, we have a linear dependence on these? Uh, you can have, um, you can, in, you can have a, a different, you can rescale this whole thing by a, a factor of V, uh, which we'll talk about in a second in the context of, for instance, Sommerfeld enhancements. Okay. So let me now take a moment and talk about a canonical WIMP. So I want to just think about this model, or think about this framework in the context of a model which is just totally, totally, I'll tell you at the outset, dead. Okay. But still pedagogically useful. So to me, the canonical WIMP would be a, a Dirac fermion, which is a, a SU2 doublet with hypercharge plus minus 1 half, color singlet. And this could be called a fourth generation neutrino, although it's a vector-like neutrino, not a chiral neutrino. Uh, uh, it could be called a pure Higgsino, right? This is the same representation that Higgsino has. You can just call it this. Um, in the early universe, this particle freezes out dominantly into W bosons. And you can calculate sigma v and you get that, where T tangent, that's tangent of the weak mixing angle. Uh, and G is the SU2 coupling. And you now have a cross-section which depends on mass. So you can take that expression and put in this expression for sigma v, and you get omega h squared is 0 0.1 times m chi over TeV squared. Okay. So we've converted the fact that we know one thing about the dark matter, namely we know it's annihilation cross-section in the early universe to one parameter about the model, namely its mass. So if you want this to be a thermal relic, you need the dark matter to have a mass around 1.2 TeV or so. Now, this is an important point to make, which is this is the sort of like, you know, deep dark secret or not so deep dark secret of the WIMP community, which is that really, if you take a weakly interacting massive particle and ask what's the natural mass scale for it, it's usually more in the TeV range. And you need to suppress the coupling somewhat if you want to get it into the sort of 100 GeV range. It's not impossible to do that. It's not even that hard to do it. It's just that, as you can see, there's nothing not wimpy about this, and it wants to be at the TeV mass. So, what suppresses the ZZ production, or just that? Uh, would ZZ be there? Well, this is. Uh, this should. Oh well, you can't. You're not going to have a single. I don't know what you mean by single Z production. I think ZZ would actually be there. But, but this is the dominant one. Oh, through like an S, through, through an S channel Z? Oh, uh, so if it's, if it's, if it's um, chi chi going through a Z into fermions, that in general, in general, that gets suppressed by the mass of the fermion. But this is the dominant one. So collider limits. At this mass, uh, there are no particularly interesting limits. The dominant limits, and I meant to write down the reference for this this morning, but I did not. But the collider limits on this type of a model come from something where you would do something like this through a Z 
And you would actually produce the charged state, not the neutral state. And then because this is an SU2 doublet, these states are approximately degenerate, but radiative correction split that by about 100 MeV. And so then this will decay. into soft pions and dark matter. So what this looks like then in your detector is that you have some track coming from the fact that you've produced a heavy charged particle that's flying through your detector, and then it decays into a soft pion. So what you see is something that's called often a stub, uh, and you can look for these things. And the limits on this currently in the ATEV data are sort of at the uh, 2 to 300 GeV level. Okay. Uh, well, I, I'm. I don't know exactly what you mean by displaced. You see a track that is coming from the interaction point, and then that extends out, and then it kind of vanishes when you produce the soft pile. Well, uh, if, if all I have is this model right here, then the only thing that um, determines the lifetime is the mass splitting between the charged and the neutral states, and that comes just from the uh, radiative corrections of emissions and reabsorptions of uh, photons and Z bosons. So, it's like the pi plus pi naught mass difference. Those are essentially irrelevant. Those are not things. They're so soft because they carry away, you know, tens of a, tens to hundred MeV of energy. Uh, so those are not really interesting signatures. So you just see something which is like barreling along, leaving a track and then it stops. So this is a, an interesting collider limit if you had a model which is much lighter than this, but at this mass, this is not um, sizable. I'm told that we'll have a good update on this from 13 TeV relatively soon. So uh, I'm not going to talk about indirect detection for this particular model. Tracy will do a lot, but let me shift gears and talk about direct detection because this is going to sort of give us our canonical basis of talking about direct detection in theory now. Tali is going to come and give you very, very extensive lectures on uh, direct detection of dark matter. But since Tali is an experimentalist, I want to give you sort of a theoristic on direct detection first. Um, the first thing is, is that there are, of course, many different types of experiments, and there are many different types of analyses. The ones that you'll hear the most are what are called spin independent searches and spin-dependent searches. Spin-dependent is a pretty good name for what they're talking about, because you're talking about dark matter that has a spin, or at least has some operator that allows it to couple the spin. Um, and so it's dependent on the spin of the target. Spin-independent is a terrible, terrible, terrible name, because it doesn't tell you anything about what it is you're looking at. Spin independent should properly be called something like nuclear charge dependent. Or neutron number dependent. Or whatever charge it is that you're coupling to. Because the idea of spin independent interactions in general is that you've got your nucleus. And it's made out of many, many different nucleons, protons and neutrons. And a proton will carry some type of charge. And a neutron will carry some type of charge. And that charge may be something akin to nucleon number, but there'll be some type of charge. And the matrix element for the scattering is then proportional to, say, the total nuclear number, or to A minus Z, or to Z. And so you end up with a cross section, which is then proportional to something like A squared. So in general, spin-independent interactions have this enhancement because it's not just some spin-dependent interactions are coupling to the spin. Spin is sort of an order one number in general, or maybe order a few when you have a lot of spin in it. Whereas if you have a large nucleus, you can have a very, very large nuclear charge of any of these types. And so you can get this enhancement to the overall cross-section. Yeah. Sorry? That's right. I'll talk about that.
So, so this is effectively like Rutherford scattering, in the sen except in the sense that it's you know, a heavy slow particle coming in instead of a relatively fast particle coming in. And so you can write the differential scattering rate. This is the sort of the canonical equation that people write. So let's just talk about this expression. Um, this is the differential event rate as a function of energy at a experiment, at an experiment which has a particular nucleus with A and Z as its target. So you could take germanium where A is 73 and Z is 32, and then you plug those in. And then the mass of the target nucleus is 73 times 0.93 MeV, GeV. Um, so let's just talk about the things that are in here. So um, NT is just the number of targets. So that's just the number of actual nuclei that you have in your experiment. Usually you quote this in terms of per kilogram. MN is the target nucleus mass. Rho chi is the density of dark matter here. And there's much debate, but usually uh, it's between 0 0.1 and 0 0.4 in units of GeV per cubic centimeter. And people will have arguments about this precisely, but the canonical value is 0 0.3 that people will take when they make their plot. So it's this number plus debate. Yes, yeah, sorry, this is real high. Um, you get this by taking models of the Milky Way based on the mass of the Milky Way and the properties of the Milky Way and then extrapolating those profiles into the uh, region of the Milky Way where we exist. Um, sigma n is the cross section per nucleon. So you want to be able to compare the CDMS experiment to the Xenon experiment to the Crest experiment. And so you need some way of, of relating these different experiments to each other. So what you do is you calculate the cross-section on an individual nucleon, say a neutron, and then you allow that to relate yourself to the different experiments. Now, usually you assume that dark matter just couples to A overall. So FP and FN are both one, and that leads you to a totally unambiguous relationship between the different experiments. But if FP and FN are not equal, if you have something that couples only to neutrons, or something that couples only to protons, or couples to something where they interfere, then you have to be a little bit more careful about relating these experiments. Is there an example of a model that actually does that? Well, so for instance, if you couple through the Z boson, uh, then you have a coupling of minus 0 0.8 uh, to protons and 1 to neutrons. Or excuse me, yeah, 1 to neutrons. Um, mu ne is the reduced mass of the WIMP nucleon system. Okay, I'm just trying to stress what here is nucleus and what here is nucleon, because if you plug in the wrong one, you'll make orders of magnitude mistakes. And z and a minus c we already said are the uh, proton and neutron numbers of the target nucleus in question. So already there, you can see that there are certain uncertainties that you have to deal with. Um, the cross-section per nucleon is a model-dependent thing, so that comes out of particle physics. It's not an uncertainty in any particular model, but it's something that you have to worry about. The local dark matter density 
if your model is ruled out by a factor of two, I would not tell you to take it ruled out. If it's ruled out by a factor of 10, um, then I would say it's ruled out. Um, but then there are these other factors where it's, there's a little bit more subtlety. So there's f squared of er. This is the form factor. So as we were just told a second ago, this scattering proportional to a squared or a minus z squared or z squared is under the limit where the scattering is coherent, so that you see the entire target nucleus as a single object. And so you can sum all the amplitudes from all the different contributions. As the momentum transfer, which is equal to 2MNER, becomes comparable to the size of the nucleus, then these different uh, amplitudes begin to interfere with each other. And that la loss of coherence is present here. So this is essentially the Fourier transform of the charge density of your nucleus, however it's distributed. Um, and so people have different ways of determining this form factor. Uh, you can assume that it's just a solid sphere of charge with a given uh, radius. You can assume that it has some edges that fall off. Uh, there are different models. They tend to not be too different if you have results that depend very, very, very uh, in detail on the particular form factor, that's probably something that you want to worry about. There's a good but old reference by Duda, Gundolo, and Kemper. Where they discuss all these different form factors, the different data that influence them, and so on. So as ER gets large, then the momentum transfer gets large. So you're essentially probing shorter and shorter distances. At that point, you no longer see a point-like nucleus. You now see an extended nucleus. And so the actual scattering process shouldn't be to essentially integrate. When you integrate, essentially, when you integrate over all these amplitudes, you're integrating over this charge distribution. But now there are slight phase shifts between them. And that leads to interference when you go to high momentum transfer. Uh, well, this is not, this is, this is actually, I mean, this is not a high energy scattering. So there is no partons here, right? This is really best thought of as some low energy charge distribution. Um, yeah. Then, so that's one thing that you have to worry about. The next thing you have to worry about is this G of V, F of V over V. So this is the f of v is the speed distribution of dark matter particles in the halo around us. And you're integrating from v min at er. So if I have a recoil of energy er, then I need a dark matter particle of a given velocity in order to have a high enough velocity to produce that energy of recoil. And so I integrate over all dark matter particles that are kinematically capable of, of giving me a scattering at the level er. And this integral is g of v. So to do this, you need to know f of v. People usually assume that it is um, approximated by a Maxwellian. So you need to characterize a Maxwellian by a velocity dispersion, which is typically around 200 kilometers per second, or 220. A rotation velocity. Because even though we're surrounded by a Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution of particles, the spiral arms are moving through it, so we're boosted relative to this Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution, and some cutoff, which is usually around 600 kilometers per second, which is the escape velocity of the galaxy. Okay, so at some velocity, the mass of the Milky Way is just incapable of keeping particles bound inside of it. And um, uh, as a function of ER, there are good closed form uh, solutions for this. Let me give you, again, a good but old reference, or old but good. And um, they have, in this paper, uh, the proper closed form expression for this integral under the assumption that it's a Maxwellian 
Halo. And I want to point that out because there are papers out there that actually have a, uh, a wrong expression. There are well-known papers that have the wrong expression, usually because they were written in a time when people had weaker computing power and so needed simpler expressions that were easier hit to handle analytically. And if you're caring about sort of the broader part of the velocity distribution and you care less about the tails, then these papers are essentially correct, or to a very good approximation correct. But once you start worrying about very high velocities or precisely how the cutoff comes into play, um, then you want to use the correct expression. I would advise you to use the correct expression all the time, and these people have it. Um, so even within a Maxwellian halo, you have these uncertainties. But then you have to worry about the fact that you, we might not live in an exactly Maxwellian halo. There can be departures from Maxwell-Boltzmann. The Milky Way is an evolving system. Stuff is falling in all the time. Uh, you can have streams of objects that have gotten disrupted. So you can have just a high velocity stream of dark matter coming from over there. Uh, and these things are just things that you can't, uh, you can't plan for. So. That said, you can go and calculate some limits. And Tali will come, and he will show you all sorts of limits from CDMS and Xenon. And they get down to about the level of 10 to the minus 46 centimeters squared these days. But it's very mass dependent. And <clears throat> for this, which one is the biggest system that is coming from the whole equation? It depends on what model you're talking about. Um, so for instance, if you're talking about light dark matter models, your biggest, biggest systematic is dealing with the high velocity tail of of this. If you're talking about a, um, a dark matter model that has a very you know, precise cancellation between these terms, then you might care more about what the, the form factor is and whether that's an energy dependent cancellation or not. Um, it's, so it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a model dependent question. The, the form factors? Well, it's, it's, it's low energy scattering, but you have to remember there are a couple things. One is, is that you're doing your low energy scattering usually with muons. So it's not exactly the same thing necessarily that's going to be coupling for uh, dark matter. So you can imagine a situation where uh, you have you had a large nucleus and you could end up with, here's just a hypothetical, right? Suppose you had a large nucleus with a neutron number that's sufficiently large that you actually get your neutrons tend to collect on the exterior of your, of your nucleus. And then let's suppose your protons and neutrons have exactly opposite couplings to this thing. Now your form factor actually is not the Fourier transform of a ball, it's the Fourier transform of a shell. And that's going to look different. And if you care about high velocity scatterings, then that can actually make a difference. In most cases, you're at low enough velocities where the form factor doesn't matter, but there are models where it does. So models where you care about high velocity scattering, um, you care very much about how rapidly this form factor is, is falling off. Yeah. FP squared. Oh, that's just convention. You're talking about over here. Yeah. yeah. So that, that, that's convention. Uh, I'm, I'm writing it this way. That's under the assumption that this is the cross section per proton. Um, and then you know that this is, in that sense, 1. Right now, I'm leaving it in some general purpose. This is the cross-section per some ambiguous nucleon that I'm not going to specify. And then fp times that is the coupling to, uh, uh, or fp squared times sigma is the coupling to protons. And fn times that is the coupling to neutrons. But, but that is very common to see it like that way. But I feel more comfortable writing it where I'm not necessarily, because what if the coupling to protons is 0? Then, you know. That doesn't usually happen, but it can. It can, of course. So if you're at IQ squared, then this description is just wrong because you can't uh, use this, this uh, factorization? Or is it, like, like you said, at high Q, Q squared, like, there's a problem. At high Q, Q squared, oh, that, that, it depends on how high Q squared, but that gets folded into this form factor. So you just start seeing an exponential die off. It looks like some sort of Bessel function, usually. And, and if you get to very, very high Q squared, then you now have to start worrying about nuclear excitations 
and other sorts of things that can go on. But usually those X stations and things like that lead to byproduct signals in the experiment such that they get thrown out. Um, so at low Q squared F, F is equal to 1? At low Q squared F is equal oh, to 1. See, see. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, that is a uh, that is a very very good question. So what I'm writing right here is uh, is appropriate for a situation where your mediator is something like the Z boson or a Higgs boson. But if your interaction has derivative couplings, uh, there's no reason why this interaction can't have additional energy dependence in it. Um, so that's those are interesting models. They tend to usually be um, hard to get appreciable rates, just because once you start introducing additional powers of Q squared in here, um, it gets suppressed by some. Q squared is of the order usually of you know tens of MeV. And then the other scales that you have in the problem are usually of the order of GeV or heavier. So you pick up these additional suppressions um, that make it hard for them to see. But, but that is, that is uh, something which is not included in this expression. If I mean that's just in general. If sigma n has an additional energy dependence. Oh, um, that's again a model dependent question. Let's 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 do one this specific model and then let's uh, let's let's talk about it. So, in the context of the model we're talking about, this um, SU2 doublet with hypercharge plus minus one half, the dominant cross section. Um, comes from um, this is the cross section off of a nucleus, okay? So a nucleus with uh, atomic uh, with proton Z and total atomic number A. A good reference for these, all these calculations is uh, Reuven. He just kind of, when he was a grad student, went and just did all of them. Uh, and so you can go find them. Um, and so if you want to rescale this, so you can see here, because of this accident that sine squared theta weak is very, very close to uh, a quarter, you get an almost cancellation of your coupling to protons and uh, one coupling to your neutrons. So they have an opposite sign, and this is like 0 0.08, and that's like 1. Um, this, when you then convert this to a cross-section per nucleon, uh, which is not, so this is capital N, this is little n, which is not totally ambiguous how to do it. But I'll do it by rescaling by an A squared. So what I would do is I pick my favorite target, say germanium, Xenon, I'll plug in an A, I'll plug in a Z. That will give me a total cross-section. I'll divide by A squared, because what they do is they multiply by A squared. So to get the cross-section that they then would use in, in, in their plots, I divide by A squared. And this is approximately 2 times 10 to the minus 39 centimeters squared. Yeah. So, so this now comes to this question of how do we do this at a parton level? So this is a situation where I can actually calculate it, because the Z boson actually couples to a current. right? And when I go down to low energies, I have those currents still present in my theory. And so even though, yes, the proton and neutron are made out of composite state of these quarks and so on, uh, at, the, at the low energy, in the same way that uh, I don't need to worry about that for the coupling of the photon, I just need to know what the electric charge of the final state is, so too here I only need to know Z and A minus Z because I'm coupling to a current. So all those sort of like particle physics uncertainties have been lost for this particular model. Yeah. This is the cross-section for pure, would be the cross-section for pure Dirac hexeno. Did Reuven get it wrong? Oh, I think that, I think, I think, you, that's a different. That's a different, different, different scenario. With a Majorana mass. Yeah. yeah. So, 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 so the, the case that Hill and Salone considered, and I'll discuss it in a second, is a situation where your your diagrams are dominated by loops. And 
This is, oh, sorry, I didn't draw the diagram. This is uh, the tree level of, exactly. This is, like I said, a Dirac, Dirac, uh, pure, true Dirac. And that's why I want to start with this one, because this model is the one that is very simple to calculate. It's just coupling to a Z boson. There's no splitting, which we'll talk about in a second. And so this is entirely calculable. Yeah. I'm only missing one of them in my notes. <laughs> um, right. So, so let's first off say that Ruben was an okay guy. He didn't get it wrong. <laughs> there are plenty of things we can say nasty about Ruben if we want to later. <laughs> nah, I kid. Ruben's a great guy. Nothing bad to say about Ruben. Um, so, um, this model was dead before I started graduate school, if you can believe that. Um, this cross-section is orders of magnitude too high compared to what they have uh, made limits. So this model is dead, dead, dead. But then you can always ask, as we were sort of beginning to have this discussion, is this model dead or is it more like Jon Snow dead? <laughs> and the answer is this is more like Jon Snow dead with all the things that, that comes with. Was it really a good idea to bring this thing back to life? <laughs> so how do you solve this problem? Well, as we were just discussing, a Dirac fermion can be thought of as a sum of Majorana fermions. Uh, right? You have two Majorana fermions that make up this Dirac fermion. They're degenerate. So if I have a Dirac mass, which is a left-right mass, and I insert some sort of diagonal Majorana mass, then I can split these two components from one another. And so this psi then gets split into psi 2 and psi 1, which are split by a mass delta. And if you take this interaction, gosh, this is totally. And then you write this now in terms of these Majorana component spinners, you find that this is uh, off diagonal. So this is a, that the interactions look like psi 2, gamma mu, psi 1, and psi 1, gamma mu, psi 2. So the only scattering that you can have is through an inelastic transition to the heavier state. And if that splitting is large enough, then you can turn this off. And thus, this theory is then saved. Um, so what then? Well, now you need to worry a little bit about the details of the model. It's pseudo Dirac. It's pseudo Dirac. This state is pseudo Dirac, or the dark matter is a Majorana fermion, because the dark matter is a Majorana fermion. Pseudo Dirac just means that I have a nearby Majorana partner, right? Or a pseudo Dirac partner. So. So one thing is that this mass splitting here has to come through some sort of higher dimension operator involving a SU2 breaking VEV. So if that SU2 breaking VEV is coming from the Higgs boson, in principle, you can worry about diagrams like this. Um, and where there's a scattering process mediated by the Higgs boson, which is also spin independent and couples to total nucleon number. And this is a situation where you actually do need to get into the particle physics to worry about what the Higgs coupling to nucleons is. Um, although this coupling ends up being approximately, um, it's about 10 to the minus three. It's roughly the mass. It's a little bit, it's, it's a little bit bigger than 10 to the minus three. It's like three 10 to the minus three. It's a few times the mass divided by the Higgs VEB. Um, what forbids that is because psi 2 is heavy enough such that it can't, that it can't uh, Yeah, so this process can happen. Mm -hmm. But once I make these things a, a big enough splitting, then you just don't have enough energy to excite that heavy state. So you, it's just a kinematic thing that you're turning off. If it's a small splitting, then it'll happen, and it'll be essentially irrelevant. If it's, the splitting is comparable to the available uh, kinetic energy, 
then you'll have these scatterings, but they'll be qualitatively different. And if you make it very heavy, then you just turn them off. And is, is it obvious that there's no pi one, uh, sorry, pi one gamma mu psi one term? Like if I diagonalize that matrix? So, so that you can actually uh, show, uh, and I was thinking about, because I haven't been giving you homework, but I was thinking about giving you the problem. But you can show that uh, if this is a Majorana and a fermion, that the psi one gamma mu psi one uh, vanishes identically. Uh, and that's just from CP. Um, there are interactions that can persist, uh, like psi mu gamma five psi, but then those have additional energy and velocity dependences that suppress them. So, so, so this kind of an interaction can be there, but it's model dependent. And if this delta is very small, then this coupling here tends to be small. And so what you're left with is, as we were just told, the fact that there are a series of diagrams, for instance, this one, where you have loops. There are also loops that produce couplings to Higgs bosons that then give you those interactions. And Hill and Salone did this calculation. We won't talk about who did the, had the sign error, uh, but Hill and Salone did the calculation correct. They have a couple papers on this. And you end up with a cross section, which is about 10 to the minus 48 centimeters squared for this model. Um, so this is sort of a very uh, simple, good, canonical model that kind of sort of lets you see how all the moving parts of uh, when talking about a WIMP. So you start with the WIMP. You start with your model. You write down its annihilation cross-section. You get as much information out of its annihilation cross-section as you can. You then, usually that gives you some information about its couplings and mass. It's one piece of information, so it'll give you one uh, equation relating them. Uh, you then look at whether or not it or its partners could be produced in a collider, the limits on them. You then calculate its direct detection cross-section. Uh, Tracy will discuss its indirect detection cross-sections. And you see whether or not it's ruled out. You find out it is ruled out. Then you find out some way that you can modify your model so that it is not ruled out. And then you write your paper. Um, it is worth noting that the reason why it's good to talk about these sorts of, of splittings and things like that is, is that uh, this is a situation where it would have been very, very easy to give up on this model. But this is not a violent thing that we've done to the theory to give it a Majorana mass. Um, it can come very simply from higher dimension operators, and uh, you don't need a very big one to, to get this effect. So it should be a lesson that you know, if you see your model being ruled out, you should really sit down and think about what you can do to, to, to keep it alive. So with that, we can segue to the question of the neutralino, because if this is my general purpose um, WIMP, then the neutralino is a variant of it. So as we said before, the neutralino is a sum of Dino, neutral Wino, and up and down Higgsino. And the MSSM and most uh, MSSM extensions, uh, the neutralino is a Majorana particle. So there are Majorana masses floating around. And as a consequence, uh, that interaction is turned off because You'd be scattering between two very, very separated states. You have a mass matrix that looks like this. I'm going to have to erase that. The precise coefficients of these off-diagonal pieces are not so relevant. So you've got a Bino mass, Majorana mass, a Wino Majorana mass, and you have a Higgsino mass here. This off-diagonal piece here is uh, coming from electroweak symmetry breaking. So if you had no masses in your theory whatsoever, then you would end up with a situation where uh, your, you had a Fotino, which is massless, and you had a Wino, which had a mass of the W boson, and you had a, a Zeno, which had a mass of the Z boson. But at this point in our lives, we now know that these parameters here are much, much larger than 
this off-diagonal piece. So unless you end up with a situation where these pieces are approximately the same, the mixing tends to be small. So most of the time, you end up with neutralinos, which are either gageno-like, so are dominated by these people up here, or are hexeno-like, which are dominated by these people down here. But you can end up with, if you have your parameters appropriately arranged, where this can be uh, reasonably well mixed. Um, as a consequence, this is then, you can understand the phenomenology by, of the neutralino, just the neutralino itself, by understanding the phenomenology of a general weakly interacting particle. So Hill and Salone will tell you how to calculate the loop corrections. You can read off the couplings when you diagonalize this, that to the Higgs boson, and you can calculate this scattering amplitude. Um, at a collider, usually your limits come from the rest of your SUSY sector. Let me make only one comment about, about the neutralino is that, and we're getting better at this, but you should be very, very careful when you read papers that will take collider limits and convert them into limits on the neutralino mass. Because depending on your model, there's a lot of, of feed through. So just as, as an example, um, in a general star SSM model, so MSSM, CMSSM, NMSS, CMSSM, whatever, there's something that goes like this. And some of this you've already heard from Chava. The Higgs is 125, right? OK, good. So at tree level, in SUSY, the Higgs is, uh, in the MSSM, the, the Higgs mass is uh, mz or less. So you need large radiative corrections to the quartic. Right, you need a to the quarter coupling of the Higgs boson. They come from top loops, but the size of these top loops is dependent on the log of the mass of the stops divided by the mass of the tops. So you need to have your stops very, very heavy. So if your stops are very, very heavy, you now know that you have the contributions to the mass of the Higgs. Right? And if you want to now have the quadratic term in your potential be the right size, you need to cancel off those quadratic corrections, which means that you now have to have, for instance, say a large mu term. That's not the only way that you can cancel this, but oftentimes in a model, you'll end up canceling uh, the Higgs mass, uh, the, the radiative correction, by adding a large mu term so that these things then give you a mass around 100 GeV that you want. But now you can see already that you've said something about your neutralino because you've made some other measurement somewhere in your theory about stops. And that's clearly, once you, you write it like this, it's very, very clear that this doesn't have to be the case. I could cancel off this correction by simply writing a soft mass for the Higgs itself, if I allow myself to do that. I don't have to cancel this with a mu term. But if I assume I'm canceling with a mu term, then I've already started informing my dark matter sector. Likewise, if I assume I have unification and I look for gluinos, the limits on my gluino mass then give me limits in effectively on my wino and mino masses. So the fact that I haven't seen a gluino below 1.6, 1.8, depending on your scenario, TeV, maybe 2 TeV, uh, tells me that now I'm pushing up my gageino components into the hundreds of GeV, several hundreds of GeV. So, um, but clearly I don't have to have unification. Right? These, are, these are assumptions that go into this. So I just say, You'll see plots, you'll see papers where people will say that this can then exclude different dark matter masses or dark matter scenarios. But very often, there's a lot of information that's not coming from the dark sector. And so just you know, caveat emptor. The neutralino does have some interesting phenomenology. Well, this is the mass matrix for four states. At the end of the day, I'm going to diagonalize it. And there's going to be one state that I'm going to be most interested in. Yeah, I mean, I'll have four neutralinos, but they'll all decay down to the lightest one. And it'll be some linear combination of, of these things. And if I have singlinos, then it'll be some linear combination of, of all of these, uh, these fermions together. Yeah. 
Um, well, so if m1 and mu are not too far off in mass, so when you, when you diagonalize any mass matrix, right, it's always a question of the off-diagonal terms divided by the difference of the diagonal terms. So if your diagonal terms are not too, too different, then an mz-sized off-diagonal piece can be an appreciable mixing. If there's a large separation between your diagonal pieces, then you can approximate your mixing by just mz divided by the Susie scale, which is, is small. But at the end of the day, really, this is just a, a 4 by 4 matrix with three easily free parameters, tan beta, which is another free parameter, which does something for you. Uh, and that's enough to, to give you uh, a wide range of, of models. So you can have ones that are most that are being of Xeno mixtures, ones that are dominantly Xenos, the ones that are dominantly Weno. All these are options. Now, it's also very common that you'll see plots that look like this. Um, although the parameter space is now increasingly constrained, so we're seeing them less and less. But they're interesting enough, so um, I just want to talk about them. So in MSSM type models, people will parameterize it in terms of various parameters, including some high energy M1 half, which is the, new, the, the unifying uh, gay genome mass at the gut scale, and M0, which is a unifying scalar mass at the gut scale. That makes all sorts of assumptions, but you'll see these plots, so let's just talk about them. Um, so the regions of parameter space that end up working is sort of here. So this region down here ends up being what people often refer to as the bulk region. This is where you end up with something which is a very, very nice mixture of, of Higgsino, Mino, and it ends up having a nice thermal relic cross-section. And that persists as you move up here. Okay. Um, oh, do I have this? No, this is, this is right. Yeah. Um, as I move out along this tail, I end up with something that's called the Stau co-annihilation region. Co-annihilation region. Where the Stau mass is approximately equal to the neutralino mass. And in that regime, uh, what happens is, is that you have an annihilation where the dark matter and the Stau together give you processes like this. Um, and so even though the dark matter itself is very, very, very weakly coupled, it stays in equilibrium with the standard model bath through uh, the Stau. And here we have something that's called the A-funnel, which is where the mass of the pseudoscalar is approximately twice the dark matter mass, so you get a resonant enhancement of that annihilation channel. And these different regions of parameter space are tuned at various levels. You know, how close in mass you need to have the Stau and the Neutralino, how close does this resonance have to be. But these are the same sorts of phenomenology you can find in models that are not the MSSM, where you have two states that are approximately degenerated mass and assist each other in their freeze out in the early universe. That leads to changes in how your intuition works. Um, resonance and annihilation, and uh, as well as ordinary regions of, of parameter space. Yeah. So on the point of knowledge, uh, I guess then the LSP is most likely Gino like. Then it's mostly Bino like, usually, yeah. yeah. Then why is uh, Tau Fona Legend and Tau Fona Legend not have a lot of difference? You think? Um, oh, well, if you have something which is dominantly Higgsino, then the Higgsino is always has its own annihilation to just ordinary particles that stays present. You, so you, it's not that you can't have co-annihilation. It's just subdominant, yeah. Whereas for the Bino, because you have such small interactions anyway, you need somebody to help you stay in thermal equilibrium. Whereas the Higgsino can stay in equilibrium all by itself. Um, so if I remember correctly, as I move this way, I move into a region where the Higgs uh, has a positive mass. Uh, there's actually a big boundary here when you impose the Higgs mass 
constraint on this that eliminates a huge region here. Uh, but that's, again, model dependent. I'm just talking about the dark matter phenomenology. Uh, over here, what sets the boundary is that when you cross the lower line, you end up with a situation where the uh, STAO ends up being the LSP uh, and not the NLSP. So you don't want your STAO to be the LSP. And that's, those are the boundaries. Here? Uh, so as you go up to very, very, you have a limit to how much, even if you have a resonance, you always have bounds on how precisely you can have that um, resonance be effective in producing a, a, an annihilation cross-section, which is to say that, an easy way to say this is, as, if I have a 10% cancellation, as I make my overall mass scales larger, then that 10% cancellation becomes a 1 over 0.1 times m squared. And as I push that up, I'm going to need a larger and larger cancellation to keep that denominator small enough, right? Because right, what you actually want is you want an annihilation cross-section, which is going to be something like 1 over m weak squared, let's say. And as I move to heavier and heavier masses, I can have, if, if the difference between these two things is too far, then I'm getting a larger and larger denominator here. My cross-section is getting suppressed. So as I move up here into heavier mass ranges, I need things to be more and more and more degenerate to keep the annihilation cross-section what I need it to be. And at some point, you run out of space because there's just a limit. You always will have the width of the, I can't make this resonance go to zero because I'll always have finite width effects that will keep me from, from doing that. So let me, oh, is it, wait, no, I have 15 minutes, right? I thought that I was done, but ha. But now I need to find that second set of, ah, good. So those are WIMPs. Let's now talk about variants on this thermal idea. So the first variant on this thermal idea that I want to talk about are dark force models. Dark force, dark sector. So, uh, can I ask a question? Yeah. What is that drop numbers for an um, if the range is where they are, this usually, as I've drawn it, this boundary up here is something like uh, TEV, couple TEV. It depends on uh, the. Since this is totally schematic, it depends on things like tan beta and mu and things like that. <laughs> what gives you the appropriate thermal relic abundance? How much of it is being ruled out by? In, then that again comes to which particular model you're talking about. In the MSSM, the imposition of the Higgs constraint. So that's why I was talking about that particular set of, of logical steps. In the MSSM, where the fact that the Higgs is 125 tells you a whole lot about your theory. Uh, almost all of this range, except for the very, very extreme uh, stalco annihilation and very, very large focus point region, are, are, are dead. But, you know, start relaxing your assumptions and you can start getting things to work again. So, so dark force models. Dark force models uh, have become a lot more popular in the last seven to eight years. Uh, they became especially popular after various anomalies, which we probably at this point don't think are coming probably from dark matter. But now they're part of our you know, parlance, they're part of our toolbox, and they're interesting in their own right. And the idea is pretty simple. The idea is what if dark matter has its own force? So the standard model has a bunch of forces. Left-handed things are charged under things that right-handed things are char not charged under. Quarks are charged under things that left ones aren't charged under. So what if dark matter is charged under something that the rest of the standard model is not charged under? It seems totally reasonable. And that can be a scalar, it can be a vector. Uh, a lot of the theoretically nicest models are vectors, so I'll start with that. So imagine that dark matter has a U1 charge, and we're going to assume here that that U1 is broken, and that that U1 has an epsilon kinetic mixing between the standard model. So there's some kinetic mixing. When you diagonalize this, what it means then is that the dark photon picks up couplings um, to, to charge with an overall coefficient of epsilon. So if you have some small mixing epsilon, then the dark photon will couple to electrons and quarks and protons with a very, very small coupling proportional to their electric charge, if this is a light 
field. If it's heavier, then you have to worry about precisely how you diagonalize the mass matrix. Um, so the way these models work is they're usually, in their simplest form, they look a lot like WIMPs, except for that they do not directly maintain equilibrium with the standard model. So dark matter annihilates into, say, dark photons. Those dark photons stay in equilibrium with ordinary photons. And thus, the dark sector and the ordinary sector are in equilibrium. And so I can calculate, when I'm doing a, uh, a freeze-out calculation, all you care about is whether something is in equilibrium with the entire thermal bath. I don't need it to be specifically directly in equilibrium with photons, as long as the temperature of the dark photons and the temperature of the photons is the same. So if this is maintaining equilibrium between the photon and dark photon, then freeze-out works um, in the uh, standard fashion. And so these things look just like ordinary WIMPs. Um, they don't look like ordinary WIMPs in the sense that they don't usually come with a whole host of colored particles or charged particles that you can look for. So most of the things that you look for are related to the dark photon. And Maxime Pospilov will give you a long series of lectures where he'll talk about all the experimental limits. I'll simply say that the biggest dark matter signals that you can have from these models come from usually the indirect detection. So dark matter can annihilate to um, A primes. These A primes can then decay into standard model fermions. If those are electrons or muons, you get high energy uh, positron signals. If those things are quarks, then you can get hadronic cascades, and those can give you gamma ray signals. And so you can get whatever indirect detection signal you want, you can build a dark force model for it now. Um, these things have a direct detection scattering cross-section, which is surprisingly large, or maybe not surprisingly large, depending on who you are. So the cross-section per nucleon, since this couples to, to electric charge, you need to normalize it for some particular nucleus. So, so as we said, the dark photon couples to ordinary matter proportional to charge, but suppressed by this mixing parameter epsilon. So the cross-section per nucleon is then suppressed by epsilon squared. Um, but you get an enhancement because you have this propagator here under the assumption that you can treat this as a contact interaction. You have a propagator here that goes like 1 over m squared in the amplitude. So it goes like 1 over m to the fourth in the cross-section. So sure, you might take a hit from a small mixing, but if you lower the mass of this thing down to a GeV or 100 MeV, you can buy yourself 10 orders of magnitude in uh, scattering cross-section. Uh, so these things can be very, very, very large cross-sections. And because you're coupling to the uh, charge current here, the, it looks a lot more like the Z coupling. Uh, and so this is a very, very large direct detection cross-section. So if you want this model to be alive, you either need to make sure that epsilon is very, very small, okay, or you need to do the same trick that we did before with the uh, SU2 doublet, which is to put in a Majorana mass and split this from a Dirac fermion into two uh, uh, non-degenerate Majorana states. Well, so, so Maxime, will talk about, Maxime will talk about, I think, all of those things. Uh, that's all in the phenomenology of, 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 of this guy right here. Um, and there's, I mean, G minus 2 is just the tip of the iceberg in terms of, of interesting things to say about it. So I'll let him say them all. Um, I'll say one more thing or two more things about these types of models, which is that they exhibit a phenomenon which does not happen in most 
neutralino models except for the very, very heaviest Wino scenarios. And that is that uh, you can have a phenomenon that probably many of you have heard of at this point, um, uh, which is the Sommerfeld enhancement. Uh, this is one of those things where nuclear physicists knew all about it, and all particle physicists had to rediscover it, except for Maxime, who knew about it all along, because <laughs> he knows these sorts of things. Um, uh, but the idea is, intuitively, that if you have a light force carrier, then uh, what that does is it means that as your two dark matter particles are coming together, usually you calculate your cross-section by just starting with some external momentum states, you send them in, and then you calculate the amplitude to go to some outgoing states. But that assumes that you can have plane wave states, right? You're just taking plane wave states and calculating some sort of a Born approximation of the interaction. But if there's a long distance interaction, then as those plane waves are coming in, they'll be distorted. Okay? Essentially, there'll be an attractive force that pulls these things together so that they like to annihilate more than they would have otherwise. Now, if you have very, very high momentum, then of course, these things will go, 